Hello and thank you for tuning in. Sorry I've been a bit quiet for the last few weeks, but I've just been busy with quite a few other things. I had a bit of time off and Meg's not been very well either, but thankfully she's okay now. I think this is the, the first time we've been out in the woods together for about three weeks, so it's really nice to be back out. So what I, what I wanted to do today is something just a little bit different. I don't typically do tutorial based videos, but I thought it might be quite nice to revisit a spot where I captured one of my favorite images over the summertime. Uh, talk a little bit about composition and then head back to the office, edit the original photograph and print it too. So we're almost there now I think. So I'll, uh, I'll go and get set up and be back in a moment. So this is a scene behind me here, which you might recognize from an Instagram post. Um, but the conditions are very different today, which is absolutely fine because the principles are still the same. We can still talk through the composition. Um, but it'd be very interesting actually just to look back at the original image and see what a difference the conditions made to the overall mood and feel and the effect of the fog and the light too. Now, for me, everything in photography starts with an emotional response. You know, we're walking along, we see something that looks great. We think, oh yeah, I like that. I want to capture that. But Mistakes can very quickly be made if we jump from that emotional side to the logical and technical execution of the image a bit too quickly. We have to explore the scene from different angles, move left, right, forwards, backwards. And that's particularly important in woodland because these small movements make a huge difference. And as we start to kind of, the more time we look at the scene and the more we start to understand it, the more we start to notice all the nuances, the more likely we are to really capture an image which captures the very essence of what we were emotionally drawn to in the first instance and then we it's far less likely to then lead to disappointment so what i want to do is just go through those same thought processes on this scene again talk through what i was thinking when i captured this scene back in july and then hopefully that will be quite useful to you and then we'll get back to the office and, and start editing so yeah, I was just walking through this local woodland on that foggy evening back in July and I came to this area here, which I have been to before, um, but I've never really captured an image that I've been particularly happy with. But I spotted this angle and looked at the scene here and I thought, oh yeah, there's definitely something there. Um, and the things that I was particularly drawn to were these lovely mossy roots just creeping up out of the ground on the, on the right hand side there. And they just twisted into this birch tree, which then arches over the top meets up with the oak trees on the left hand side we then come down the left hand side we've got this rowan tree or mountain ash as some people call it that's just creating a bit of an anchor point on the bottom left hand corner but what was particularly nice is that we've got this long reaching slender mossy covered oak branch just reaching out into the middle and that area of space in the middle of there was just filled with fog and that fog just sucks light down and create this lovely feeling of space and softness and that ethereal quality in the middle of the frame and actually having the summer leaves was an advantage uh, in this instance too because having that canopy just helped to create that frame around the, the top and the left and the right we had the softness of the leaves on the top uh, top right hand corner that was balanced quite nicely with the softness of the leaves on the rowan tree the weight of the oak trees on the left was balanced nicely with the weight of the roots and the uh, birch trees on the right hand side um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I've talked before about having this kind of flow and connection, but the way these branches all kind of spiral and flow around the edge of the frame and are kind of connected with each other, that kind of quality just allows your eye to kind of travel around the image, but then ultimately be drawn back to that long reaching branch and that lovely area of light in the middle. Well, that's the idea anyway. Um, so yeah, I could see how this was starting to piece together quite nicely, but our position is super important because there's a couple of things to watch out for. We've got pine tree trunks on the left hand side, we don't want them in. There's a pine here and some branches there, again we don't want that in, so we can't go too far back. But equally we don't want to go too far forward because then we're shooting very wide, we start to distort the perspective a little bit. Um, and then we'd also start to look up at that branch at the top, which I didn't want to do. That top branch is super important to 
as part of its character, as part of its framing and its connection with the branches on the left hand side. So it's important that we stay quite high and look down on the scene a little bit. And also if we're looking up, then patches of sky are going to become an issue too. And what we really don't want is distracting areas of light. We need to stay a little bit further back. We need to get the tripod nice and high, try and get as much of that canopy behind that top branch as possible. Um, so I think what I'll do is try and get the tripod set up now, see if I can kind of get the same composition together and then talk through a couple of my other thinkings behind it. Right, so I think I've got the tripod in the right position. Um, I'm far enough forward that I can take these pine trees out the equation. Like I said, I want my camera nice and high so that I can bring in that top branch without the sky causing a problem and also put it in the right position so that it connects with the branches on the left and creates that lovely framing around the scene. Now, what I see quite a lot on workshops is people getting a bit distracted with what they see on the back of the camera, i.e. that three by two aspect ratio. For me, I think it's super important to try and visualize your end aspect ratio. When I assess the scene, I'm trying to decide, right, where does my image start and where does it finish? Left to right, top to bottom, where's it absolutely no compromise whatsoever? But when I know exactly where my edges are, so for example here, I know that the rowing tree is an anchor point on the, on the bottom left. I don't need anything further down other than the base of this long reaching oak branch. I don't need anything further to the right than those tree roots. I don't need much up top other than some space above that arching branch. And when I can start to visualize my edges, then I can see the aspect ratio um, and then I can visualize exactly what I want to achieve. So I have very limited crop options in camera with a Sony, but I can set up a six by four grid pattern and that allows me to visualize five by fours and squares. So for me, the scene works perfectly as a five by four. I can um, set it up within the grid pattern here, then recenter the camera and then I'm good to go. You know, we don't have, I don't think we've got all these pixels just so we can capture them on and crop it afterwards. We're far more likely to get a successful result that is reminiscent of what we remember and is at the best possible uh, perspective if we decide on what the aspect ratio is while in the field and we get it right in camera. So what I typically do is um, open my aperture right up, give myself a shallow depth of field, focus manually on the subject there, then set my aperture back to where I want it. It just enables me to fine tune the focus a little bit better. That's all good to go. Even in these kind of flatter conditions, you can see the oak leaves on that long reaching branch, how they just catch the light in that opening the canopy there. So you can start to imagine when the fog was there, just how that light was sucked down, really, really nice. So yeah, that's that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pack up now, head back to the office, edit the original version, um, and then do a spot of printing as well. Okay, so I'm back in the office and ready to do some editing. Now, I know that editing videos aren't particularly exciting, so I'll get through this as quickly as I possibly can. Um, but this is the original RAW file uh, taken in July this year. As you can see, it's been imported into Lightroom a little bit on the dark side, which is absolutely fine. I know that in the field, I was conscious of some of the bright spots and I didn't want those to burn out. But knowing the capabilities of my camera, uh, knowing that I didn't crush any blacks, I know that I can bring out the shadow detail with absolutely no problem whatsoever. So just very quickly I want to mention, which I have mentioned before, that I am always develop on a white background because if you develop on a dark background, it makes the image look brighter than it actually is. Um, um, and then you'll wonder why your prints come out so dark. Now, I just want to reinforce the point of choosing your aspect ratio in the field and visualizing how you're going to crop because you can see here, we obviously don't want this pine tree on the left hand side. But if in the field we've got two 
too preoccupied with the three by two aspect ratio or what we saw on the back of the LCD screen, then we possibly would have zoomed in and then cropped in too far at the top of the top and the bottom. But by knowing where our edges are in the field, we know already that this is a four by five. So we're gonna go straight to the crop tool, choose four by five, position it exactly where we wanted our edges to be, which is round about there. And there we go, there's your cropping done, nice and easy. So like I said, it's coming a little bit dark. So really what I want to do is just kind of flatten the, the scene a little bit to start with and just get the image into a nice neutral position. So now I always choose a white balance, which is representative of what I can see with my own eyes. It was quite a cool evening, but now that I've come to processing, I just think it's just a little bit too much on the cool side. So I'm just gonna increase the warmth a tad. Uh, now I usually find that greens are quite tricky, so I usually combat them by just introducing a little bit of magenta and it just helps to tone back some of those greens a tiny bit. So I'm going to increase the exposure by quite a lot actually, almost a full stop. And you can see straight away all that detail very quickly starts to come through. Um, I'm not going to touch the contrast slider, very very rare that I do. I am going to bring the highlights down though, probably to about there I think just to get some of those brighter areas under control do the same with the shadows similar sort of point you can see everything is starting to look a little bit sort of soft and flat but that's absolutely fine for now you could introduce some contrast with the whites and blacks but I do it in the tone curve which I'll come to shortly you might see me mention before that I always always have negative clarity on my woodland shots because you know, I'm thinking about what I enjoy when I'm there in person and it's that lovely kind of soft, mysterious, ethereal quality of woodland, particularly when you get foggy days like this. And I want to maintain that. So too much clarity, too much sharpness is going to make everything look a little bit too brittle. So I brought the clarity down, but this new slider in Lightroom texture, I'm actually going to bring that up slightly and that's just going to bring back a little bit of the crispness in some of these lovely, delicate details of the birch branches and leaves. Uh, skipping the straight down to the tone curve now. Now this is where I add contrast so globally we can boost the lights up and then straight away it adds a little bit more punch to the image. Bring the darks down slightly to minus 10. Straight away we start to see a little bit more contrast in the scene. But I'm not so happy with the colors at the minute so I tend to fine tune the color with some simple adjustments in HSL. So I'm going to start with saturation. I think the green is a little bit too much. I don't want that to pop too much. So I'm going to bring down the saturation there. Now, if we look in this area here, there's a little bit of kind of aqua coming through, which I'm not that keen on. So I'm going to bring down the saturation of that, but I'm actually going to boost the saturation of the yellows because I think that will just do quite nice things for some of these mossy areas here and just give them a little bit of a lift and some of these oak leaves out in the distance there. Um, so I think that's fine on saturation. Now I'm just going to boost the luminance, luminance in some of the areas too. So I'm going to start with the orange um, because there is some kind of orange detail coming through on the, the wet trunk of the birch trees and in some of the earth here. So it'd be quite nice just to lift that a little bit. So I'm going to take that up relatively high. I'll do the same with the yellow because again I think that'll give a nice boost to some of the, the mossy areas here. Um, green can even come up a, a tad, a little thing, and I'm actually even going to increase the luminance of the aqua um, just because actually lifting the luminance of it back here will just help to soften the area a little bit, which is quite nice. Now jumping down to split toning. Now I frequently use split toning uh, just to a small amount. It typically involves adding a little bit of warmth to the highlights. Um, so I'm going to choose a warmth of about a, a hue of about 43 and I don't need much Just 10 has already started to add quite a lot of warmth to the image But I want to counteract that and get a little bit more tonal contrast by adding a little bit of coolness to the shadows So a hue of about two three four is quite cool and Then just five five is enough any more than that and it starts to look a little bit too unnatural I'm going to click on remove chromatic aberration um, I'm not going to do anything in these tabs, so I'm now going to start and look at some local adjustments. So you might have seen me do this before. Um, now I'm just going to zoom out a little bit because it's really useful just to assess the image with these bigger borders. So we can see, it makes it easy to sort of see where the light and dark areas are. But what I'm also going to do is just press control square bracket twice and turn the image upside down. Now you might have seen me do this before. Um, 
and it's it does seem odd but it really does work because the whole idea is that i'm moving my natural relationship with these recognizable objects and i can be much more objective about the balance of light color and shadow through the scene so for me it becomes much more instantly obvious that this area down here or up there is a little bit too light it's kind of catching my eye a little bit i love this bit through here and the way the lights fill in this space that's really really nice but that's definitely catching my eye too much so while I'm still upside down, I'm going to take a radial filter. I'm just going to draw over this area like that. And that's a good thing about being zoomed out a little bit more as well. We can draw these big radials and have a much more gradual effect into the into the scene here. Um, but yeah, just drop the exposure down to about minus 0.4, I think is enough. And I'm looking at these other areas um, and they actually feel pretty well balanced. A little bit dark and heavy over here, I think. So I'm going to want to boost that a little bit. And I probably just want to bring down the highlights here. So while I'm still upside down, another big radial like this. Just want a nice gradual effect, a good feather. Um, and I think I'm just going to bring the highlights down quite far. Maybe around about there. And then also bring the white swipe right back as well. That's just going to kind of flatten it down a little bit and make that top area a little bit softer. Bring it back the other way around. Like I said, I think this is a little bit dark and a little bit heavy over here. So I'm going to get another big radial. I'm going to very quickly just draw over like this. We get a nice gradual effect, so maybe it's a little bit too big. Um, now, I just want to increase the exposure just a little bit, I think. 0.3 straight away just 0.3 has lifted out a lot of detail there which looks really nice but I'm going to bring the highlights down quite a lot just to make sure those bright spots aren't becoming too much of an issue um, and I'm just going to lift the shadows a little bit as well that should do it I still think we can get a little bit more detail out of this so I don't use a brush very often but I think in this instance just a very quick brush effect over this area here so what I'll probably do is just increase the exposure touch, but I'm probably going to be more interested in just boosting the white detail here. So I'll start with a fairly small brush and just basically go down like that, make sure we're injecting a bit of light over these lovely tree roots here. And there we go. It's as, as simple as that, really. Um, but if I just disable that, you can see what a difference that's made. Uh, but the trick is to you know keep these things nice and natural this bit down here is a subtle detail but it is very important i've purposely included it just rather than cropping off down there but it's maybe just catching my eye just a tiny tiny bit so i'm just going to put a radial over that and just drop the exposure ever so slightly there just so it's not catching my eye too much now again thinking about our thought processes while in the field and where we felt as if the we wanted the viewer's eye to go when looking at the scene. And like I said, I want to kind of travel around the scene, but then ultimately end up in the middle and just traveling up this lovely mossy oak branch. So I'm going to take quite a big radial now, and I do this quite a lot, is just have a, a huge radial like that over the middle. I'm just going to boost the whites. I'm gonna to go to OTT, about plus 30 and that's really kind of emphasized the light that's being sucked down by the fog in that open area so yeah yeah that's quite nice quite happy with that that's looking pretty good some pretty simple changes to that so far so now i'm going to there's a couple of little things that i'd quite like to do in photoshop which um, i can't really do here so i'm just going to edit in photoshop okay so here we are in photoshop there's just a couple of small things there's this branch up here from the pine tree which is a bit of annoyance you know i did notice it in the field there's nothing i could do about it there so i just had to accept it and know that i had to deal with it afterwards i do try to avoid things like this but this should disappear quite easily so i'm going to zoom into 100 percent like that i've got the polygonal tool uh selected i'm just going to draw around this we don't have to be super accurate i think you could spend a bit more time over this and do it section by section but i think this will suffice for what we want to achieve then i'm just going to hit the delete key make sure content where is selected there okay and there we go it's not it's not ideal it's not done a fantastic job but to be honest i, I would probably accept that because 
by the time you've printed it, nobody's going to notice, and absolutely nobody's going to notice that uh, when I post it online either. So I think I'm going to live with that for now. That's absolutely fine. So I'll just deselect that. Now, the other thing that I do fairly often, but not always, is add a little bit of autumn effect. Now, the trick with the autumn effect is not to overdo it. So it's just to use it to a subtle amount. But the reason why I'm doing it is not to get an enchanted forest feel. It's just to really kind of enhance that soft quality and sometimes enhances that painterly quality a little bit too. So the way that I do it is probably probably like a really old fashioned way, but it works for me. So I'm just going to press Control J to duplicate that layer. I'm going to go to image, apply image, make sure the blending mode is set to screen, press OK. Um, and now I'm going to duplicate that layer. I'm going to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, radius is set to 24, that's absolutely fine. Click OK. So these two new layers, I'm now going to select them, blend them together, select merge layers there. Then I'm going to change the mode here to soft light in this instance. Now you can see at 100% opacity, everything's become very soft and glowy and, and enchanted, and it's just way over the top for my liking. So we're going to knock that down to about 21. That looks really nice. So if I just disable that layer, and you can see what a difference it's made in terms of just enhancing that softness a little bit. It's added a little bit of glow to some of these lovely kind of highlight areas on the moss, all the moss up here on the leaves here, some of the detail in the birch bark. So yeah, it, it's subtle, um, but it works. And I don't, in my mind, you wouldn't necessarily look at this image and think, oh yeah, an autumn effect has been applied. It's just about these tiny little changes here and there. So for me, I think that's ready to print now. So when it comes to printing, there's some crucial steps to make sure that you get good, accurate prints. Now, I don't have time to go through the whole process now, but I'll very quickly mention that obviously calibrating and profiling your monitor is super important. So I use a data color Spider X. It works really well. It's much quicker than the previous generations. So that comes recommended. But once your monitor is sorted, then get some custom profiles made for your papers of choice. Now, you might have seen before that I use photo speed papers. I have done for quite some time. Um, I have no reason to change. They work really well for me. Now, in terms of which of their papers to use for this particular image, well, I think you have to think very clearly about your style of photography and the type of paper that's going to suit your particular image because I don't think my images suit high kind of vibrancy, glossy in your face type print. I think they're much suited to something a bit more subtle. I want that kind of nice kind of classic timeless feel. So once it's behind glass, it gives it another extra lift and lease of life. So I particularly like matte textured papers. So I think the Platinum Etching 285 would work really well here. That little bit of warmth in the paper works very well with the greens in the picture. I think it's going to give that bit of warmth that I wanted in the fog. Where you've got these softer areas, the texture of the paper will start to come through really nicely. I think just as good actually would be the any kind of smooth matte paper such as the smooth cotton or the platinum cotton would work well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go for the platinum etching 285 to start with. So in terms of actually getting the print started, I'm going to press Control P. I'm going to go into print settings, make sure that map photo paper is selected. I've got highest quality print. I'm going to do an A3 print to start with. I'm going to click on the main tab up here and just double check that I've got manual ticked for color intensity. And I'm going to set matching and ensure that none is selected. I just want to make sure that the printer isn't going to mess with the colors at all. Back in the print dialog here, I want to make sure I've got Photoshop manages colors selected and then that allows me to select the printer profile or the paper profile, which is the platinum etching 285 there. Now, photo speed, I've always recommended using a perceptual rendering intent. That works well for me. I'm going to go down here. Now, if memory serves me well, this size paper is going to suit a print size of 25 centimeters high. I'm going to reduce the top margin to 1.5. That's going to give me a bigger margin down there, which is going to give some extra room for numbering and sign in the print here. Now, I'm going to reduce the left margin to 1.6 which will actually give me a pretty equal margin to the top. And then all I've got to do is trim the right hand side. So I think that's ready to go. That looks pretty good. So I'm going to pop some paper in the printer and see how it turns out.
So here's one that I printed earlier on A2 platinum etching paper and I'm really pleased with how it's turned out but if you want to take a closer look at the image then it is already on the gallery section of my website but I think to be honest I might put it up as a limited edition print because yeah I'm really quite happy with how it's printed. Um, but one other thing before I disappear you might have noticed this a little bit earlier in the video but I've had these fantastic bottles made up which I'll be giving away for free to clients attending my four to six day residential workshops. Um, the idea being that I can keep workshops completely free of single use plastic bottles but I thought it'd also be nice to put these up for sale on my website so these are now available to pre-order. But they're a lovely stainless steel bottle, I've had my logo laser etched onto the front uh, so there's no paint, it's a nice sustainable bamboo cap. Um, they've been made by Clean Canteen who are 1% for the planet company. So yeah, a really nice high quality stainless steel bottle. Uh, this is just a pre-production model but the rest are coming very soon. Um, but yeah, please take a look at them. Anything like this is really good for supporting me and my channel. I've never accepted any sponsorship. I just wanted to keep it about things like this, prints and workshops, things like that. But thank you very much for watching this episode. Uh, I hope you found it useful. I know it's been a bit of a, a long one. But yeah, thanks very much for watching. And as always, I hope to see you for the next one.